thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Steve McMenamin, I'm out from Indian Harbor. Uh, I'm your host for today's event, which is uh, part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Uh, joining us this morning, uh, to my right, is Bob Aaron, the Department of uh, Derivatives Portfolio Management. Uh, I'd like to thank Bob uh, for sponsoring today's event. And uh, for those of you who don't know DPM, uh, you should. Uh, DPM tackles some of the most difficult projects in portfolio accounting and administration. Uh, we'd also like to thank Mr. Stan. Our topic this morning, valuation, challenges, and issues. Uh, we'll attempt to put an interdisciplinary context uh, to the many uncertainties that loom over both our private and public markets. And before we begin today, I again like to ask you as a courtesy to our speakers to please go out the back side of the invitation cards you received at the door this morning. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, sitting uh, next to Hunt, uh, Vadim Zalotnikov is the Chief Equity Strategist for Sanford Bernstein. He heads the Quantitative Analysis Group and the Technology Strategy Group uh, for that firm. Before joining Bernstein in 1992, Vadim was a management consultant with Booz Allen and Hamilton for six years and a research engineer with Bell Labs for two years. He's an IA All-American Analyst, and Vadim earned his Master's in Electrical Engineering from MIT and an MBA from Stanford. Sitting to Vadim's left is Linda Ionary. Linda is the audit partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the hedge fund private equity and investment banking practice. Linda has been active in the audit practice in New York since she joined Price Waterhouse in 1978. Linda represents Price Waterhouse at the AIMR. She advises that firm's hedge fund and buyout clients on investment performance measurement issues. Linda's community work includes serving as a board member of the United uh, Neighborhood Houses and the Fund for Modern Courts in New York. Linda is a certified public accountant and she earned her bachelor's in science degree from Penn State University. Sitting to Linda's left is Larry Heller. Larry is the general partner of Quadrangle Partners and Heller Advisors, a firm that focuses on workouts and liquidations. Before Quadrangle, Mr. Heller was a portfolio manager of distressed companies in the energy and power industries at Odyssey Partners. Before Odyssey, Larry was investing in stressed energy companies for BT Securities, and he earned an MBA from University of Chicago in 1998. And with that, I will turn it over to Hunt Taylor. Good morning. Um, here's why I think valuation is uh, an underappreciated skill set. Um, it's because we live in a world of disconnects. Uh, they exist all around us. They exist on a, on a grand scale. They exist on a small scale. Um, you know, an example of a disconnect on a small scale. Um, I walked into my bank, and this is absolutely true, I can promise you, the door to the safe was wide open, but the pens were chained to the desk. <laughs> and to add insult to injury, this was in the trust department. Um, to go one step further, um, I actually, at the same bank, drove up, drove up to the ATM uh, automated teller and found that the numbers were also in Braille. <laughs> Try and think of the logic behind that one. Um, but we see these disconnects on all sorts of levels uh, in markets uh, all the time. Here's another one. We pointed out at this panel that um, Japan's bonds are rated lower than Botswana's, right? You know, lower than a company that they send foreign aid to. Um, and what is the consequence? Well, they're forced to pay the egregious rate of 0.001% to borrow your money. Huh? God, what if they were upgraded? Then they'd have to pay 0.00001% to borrow your money? There's a disconnect there. Well, um, 
There's, there are disconnects all the time. I mean, you know, not long ago, um, the stock market, the Dow Jones was trading well over 10,000, and the risk-free rate was under 2%. Well, not both of those were right. The stock market was telling you the economy was fine. And these companies had profoundly good prospects, and the risk-free rate was telling you we're in, a, you know, in, in, in an economy that desperately needs stimulation. Well, clearly they, won't, they, they, they weren't both right. Um, here's one that I picked out recently. Um, did you know that the, the 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average are now carrying some $3.3 trillion in debt, but their book value is some $728 billion? Now, if you took out the uh, 500, excuse me, 200, and, what is it? Mm -hmm. subtract out the goodwill, you're left with $510 billion of net tangible assets. That gives you a leverage ratio of 6.5 to 1. Now, I'm comfortable um, with a great risk manager like Paul Jones running a fund at 6.5 to 1. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the average Dow blue chip company running a leverage ratio of 6.5 to 1. Um, sounds more like a leveraged LBO fund to me. Now, this is, you know, the legacy of stock buybacks. Um, as companies no longer carry retained earnings, they buy their stock back to make their options good. Um, let's take the extreme example. GE is carrying some $448 billion in debt against net tangible assets of $24 billion. That's a leverage ratio of 18 to 1. Now we're starting to get into long-term capital territory. Uh, and that's as blue a blue chip as you get, but... But it just seems like a, a tab, like a disconnect. And all of this takes me back to an episode of The Simpsons I once saw, where Homer wakes up. Or Homer gets a tip on a stock called Animotrin, or Anim Animotion, and uh, sneaks out and takes the whole family life savings um, and p plunks it down on Animotion. And he wakes up the next morning, looks on the news, and the, uh, the announcer announces that... Uh, uh, and emotion is up 75 cents after plunging $200, to which he says he hopes plunging means up. Um, and uh, then he declares that uh, that's because Anna Motion has declared super duper bankruptcy. Um, and you know, you got to wonder if one of these days uh, we're going to wake up and see if one of these Fords or what have you. Um, you know, going to pull a world come, and, and they're going to wind up declaring like Enron or so. Is there is there another super duper bankruptcy coming down the pike? So all of this leads me back to um, the statement um, that was made by you know Warren Buffett many years ago, uh, and, and what he he deemed the key to success um, investing in the equity markets. He said you have to view um, every position in a stock as as being part of owner of a company in partnership with someone he called Mr. Market. He said Mr. Market was a perfectly nice guy. He said, however, he was prone to wild emotional swings and that uh, on any given day, Mr. Market might um, run into your office on the back of some negative news and offer to sell you his share in the company at some ridiculously low price. Or uh, on another day, he might run into your office on the back of some positive news and offer to buy your share in the company at some wildly inflated price and that the key to success was being um, able to value that company better than Mr. Market could. Hopefully what we have are three people that can give us some insight as to uh, how to accomplish that um, uh, a little more ably than we are um, today. So the way I'd like to conduct this is I'd like to start on the most macro level um, with Linda, uh, take it down to the more specific level with Vadim, and then uh, we'll do the, the general. Well, Linda, I think even more. She's, 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 uh, yeah, and then uh, we'll let Larry finish it up, and then uh, I'm going to toss to the audience for questions, and uh, I'm going to feel free to just provoke and annoy and um, do my, my usual thing. Um, my usual thing in the interim. So, uh, Linda, would you kick things off? Certainly valued in a portfolio, and some are more exhaustive than others. And you'll see a few different things, and I wanted to just mention a few matters there. One, 
is that you will not always see those financial the, the financial information referred to generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, if it's important to you, you need to understand whether the information you're going to get is in accordance with GAAP. Sometimes private equity funds choose not to report to you in accordance with GAAP. They will use another basis of accounting. That may be tax. It may be their own special brand. And it's uh, important to understand that those special brands may not necessarily give you all the information you want. Usually those are, are um, techniques that will write down investments but never write them up unless they actually exit. Equally as important in that is whether there is a, an, an active advisory committee uh, that is approving investment valuations and I would just uh, caution you that you, you know, may want to understand the uh, role of the advisory committees to the extent that they are provided for uh, because uh, not all funds treat their advisory committees the same nor do all advisory committees have the same roles or responsibilities in, in funds. Uh, in looking at uh, valuation issues in terms of information that you are provided, I think it is important that you understand the information that you're going to get. And once again, I would suggest during that phase that you inquire about getting and receiving raw data from fund investments in order to be able to do your own analyses. Getting into actually a little bit about how the valuations are done and what we're seeing in the current marketplace, there's a few points that I think are important, especially today. Uh, Traditionally, you're all familiar with the concepts that if you're looking at a private equity investment, that one of the valuation techniques that are, is often used, especially from a reporting standpoint, is, is a cost mechanism. Record things at cost, report something at their cost. And from that perspective, the, especially from an institutional standpoint, it is more common than not to see that adjusted downward because of poor performance and adjusted upward only if there is a significant third round. And um, while I appreciate that that is an institutional view and it's a conservative view, it's not necessarily always consistent with what uh, generally accepted accounting principles would require. And it's also not consistent with what a lot of boutiques do. They feel that they have a little bit more flexibility, so it's not uncommon to see more boutique or not uh, places that are not affiliated with institutions be more generous in terms of their valuations of their private equity holdings. And what I mean by that is that they will look at budget versus actual results do more active discounted cash flows analysis, liquidity analysis, comparable analyses, and then use the results, which usually reflect a range of possible values, and actually mark things into that space as opposed to keeping it at a cost. Now, I'm not going to say one is right and one is wrong, but what I will say is that they are different and they can render different results and it is once again incumbent upon the receiver of that information to appreciate the protocol and exactly you know, why, if you had an institutional fund, it might be writing something, uh, keeping it at a cost basis, and a, and a private fund might be writing that up. One of the serious issues that we're seeing in this market right now, um, and it, it only has an, uh, you know, the only name we use, we call it right now, is the cram down issues that we're starting to see that are having some impact on valuation and um, while those of you who are unfortunately familiar with cram downs from a bankruptcy standpoint, this type of cram down has to do with if you're a private equity investor in a tranche, an equity tranche, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> in an equity tranche, company is doing poorly and um, investors are coming in to, the, to a second round which in essence wipe out the value of the first round of equity. If you are invested in a private equity fund, and you have an investment in one of these in, in uh, types of uh, securities where you are subject to having your equity position rights being wiped out. One of the things that we're starting to see is if you're, if you're working with a, a general partner who has other funds or a second fund or a third fund, whether or not that additional investment is coming out of your fund or is actually benefiting other investors. 
And from a cram down standpoint, once you put that second investment in a fund that is disparate from your ownership, you will you stand to suffer and somebody else stands to gain within the same control environment of a general partner you might be working with. I think that these are issues that you should be aware of, not because they're rampant right now, but because the opportunities exist for these cram downs to continue. And it is possible as investors that your rights, um, you know, need to be uh, to be asserted a little bit more formally if indeed additional investments are coming out of sister funds where you're not participating. And the value and the benefits would accrue to those investors and would not accrue to you. So there are a number of issues in the private equity markets as it relates to valuation. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Association of, uh, for Investment Management Research, AIMR, they are coming up with additional standards for valuation and for performance. These are far way off. Um, just, to, just to close, there is no right answer. There is no one way for valuation. Uh, what's important to one group at one time may not have any value to another group. And I, can, I see companies being valued by different, total group, different groups of people vastly differently because of what their objectives are for the company and what they plan to do with it. And so all I can say is that it is definitely not a, a science. Okay. It is clearly an art. And it's art that um, uh, I, I think has been, uh, has got a lot of uh, influences from a lot of smart people. And it's an area that I think is going to continue to receive a lot of uh, attention. So I wish you all the best of luck in investing. And uh, um, keep your, your pocketbooks open and your minds open. But... Uh, Watch it out there because you know people are are excited for your money, and um, you know they they will tell you what you want to hear. Uh, Linda, something that came out when you and I were talking on the phone <clears throat> was that you interestingly were um, in the epicenter of two of the best known blowups. <laughs> Of, uh, it's still here to start talking about yeah, it's still here, yeah. Uh, but you were in the meltdown at Drexel, and you were in the SWAT team that went into uh, long-term capital. So quickly, uh, I'm going to ask you to capsulize, if you can, uh, whether there was a, a commonality that you could extract from those two experiences and send it uh, in the form of a lesson to investors? Is there something that investors could have picked up ahead of the fact that could have protected them from being exposed to those two events? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, Which is what people usually say when they're about to not give you the answer. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you an answer. Okay. I don't know that it would be the, it's not going to be the, quite the same answer for each one. I think uh, quickly, okay. uh, from a you know from a Drexel standpoint, um, and it's it's such a it's kind of in the past, but um, uh, I think that the lesson there, which I think has been learned, is knowing who you're dealing with and understanding that there are many Drexels. And just like there are many different companies in all of our large financial institutions, there are many lessons at Drexel, but one of them, from maybe from my perspective, was is that I'm not sure that those that were invested really appreciated which entities they were invested in and how they related to the whole. I mean, that's not something that people talk about because the other issues were so massive and you know in terms of the credit market but if you look at it for from an inside one of the more interesting things was you know there were a hundred different little pieces of Drexel and they don't carry the same so the, so the lesson is the reciprocal of know your client it's it's know your client you know subsidiaries guarantees etc etc it was uh, it was a I think a big lesson learned for the marketplace, in which there was some advancements in the regulation to assist in that, but that was a huge issue. And I do see that from time to time, especially now where the credit markets are so global, that that issue sometimes creeps back in. Do you really know exactly which entity are you doing business with? Okay. What about long-term capital? Long-term capital, uh, you know, not to be too glib or anything about it, uh, Certain things, 
good returns without understanding the uh, you know the risk you know the risk involved with that you don't you don't understand you didn't know that the return was not necessarily reflective of the actual risks that were taken and sometimes things can look too good to be true and when they do look like that sometimes they are too good to be true don't find numbers <laughs> Right. I don't think you know there are a lot of smart people, and you know I, I don't know I don't know that it was. Um, yeah, what we see in our shop things. is common sense over statistics. It was a lot of uh, you know couldn't, could it continue forever? Can you have that kind of return? You know, do you get something for nothing? I don't know. It's all those different things. Okay. So, two different types of circumstances. All right. But in your turn. All right. Um, Greenspan and many others have seen what they call the productivity miracle. If you extrapolate that differential of growth of 150 basis points for 100 years or so, you could justify almost any valuation you want. So if you were a believer in the productivity miracle, you in fact could quite rationally come up with S&P valuations that was, that was uh, in the 14, 1500 range. Then you could argue for lower risk premium, etc., etc. Unfortunately, as we look back, or even when we were there, had you adjusted what was essentially pro forma earnings for things like pension funds, options, non-recurring items, which were treated as, which were taken out of the equation, you would have found that the real earnings growth was not 7.2, but actually closer to 5, just below the GDP growth of 5.6. So in fact, the bubble was caused by perception of what was a productivity miracle, an economic miracle, which turned out to be really an accounting miracle. And what, that's what we're really paying for. And one of the things as a value investor you try to do is to avoid mixing the two up. The economics, which, are, which have been grounded in the last century of data, and uh, accounting, which tends to move with time and, and tends to be accommodative uh, at times. Uh, so when you select stocks and you think about uh, the value universe, I think of it in two ways. One, uh, using a dividend discount model or dis dividend discount cash flow model, which essentially presumes one thing, that all companies, after 10 or so years, will revert to some sort of market growth rate, which we know from the last 100 years of history is about 2.5% real growth, 2.5, 2.6. Real, not nominal. The second way I look at value is if I no longer had this job, what would I do? And I look at companies that are in the public domain right now that I could conceivably take out private through an LBO transaction and feel comfortable doing it. Because to me, ultimately, that sets the trough valuation for many of the stocks. Now, it, it seems relatively straightforward, right? The, 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 the dividend discount model simply presumes what has been well documented is the mean reversion. Very few companies, if any, grow at 15% for 10 years, despite the uh, best attempts by uh, analysts to prove that. It just doesn't happen. And so mean reversion theory works. You could generally come up with reasonable numbers. Yet, value managers blow up, right, every now and then. And they blow up usually for two reasons. So the way you blow up using a dividend discount model and the way you can get it wrong is twofold. One um, is the stock, well, actually the same point, is the stock doesn't mean revert. Now, why doesn't it happen? In technology, which is an area I'm, I'm very familiar with, the average public life of a technology company is five years. If you have a 10-year mean reversion schema, you'll be wrong, almost always. Furthermore, in industries where the buyer of your product is risk-averse, success tends to breed, breed, breed more success. Somebody who buys a software system takes a career risk very frequently on the infrastructure software. And big get bigger, successful get more successful, and mean reversion doesn't work. In fact, mean reversion becomes ex extinction. If you stumble, you tend to stumble per, uh, continually. So differentiating between industries which are driven by product obsolescence and where the probability of mean reversion is very low and areas which have long asset lives and long lives of, of, of companies is critical. And if you don't do that, you will absolutely blow up. In software, the average life of a software company, public life, is three and a half years. So it's not really good odds. 
This is one area where value investors will make the biggest mistakes. Always ask yourself a very simple question. Even today in the big discussion of uh, pharmaceuticals, if you uh, develop a, a grave illness, would you pay an extra 20 bucks for a drug or would you go with a generic? <laughs> now, again, I, I'm, for some people it will be different answers, but you should include that basic test of the buyer being mean, risk, risk averse. In, in, in your thinking as to whether big get bigger, successful get more successful, or you will in fact have mean reversion where success is ephemeral and you will return. The second thing is very exciting to me, um, the LBO candidates. If you, and there are a number of ways of, uh, of analyzing it, but being a strategist, I, I tend to do it in a, in a very top-down way. But if you define some of the characteristics of an LBO candidate, which means having, in me, for me, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a cash flow-based LBO as opposed to an asset play, and you look simply at the cash flow yield uh, on the enterprise value that would be sufficient to fund an acquisition, as a, as a very kind of basic definition of an LBO candidate, uh, and you, you, you're, you're, you can make some assumptions about where you could buy the, uh, the, at what level you can buy the junk tranche, uh, senior tranche, etc. But having done all that background work, let me tell you the conclusion. If you apply some basic tests of an LBO candidate to the public market today, you would find that uh, today uh, there's, you have the highest percentage of the companies that you could take public or private in the market today since 1983, which was incidentally the start of a giant LBO boom and also the acquisition boom. So to me, this is the most exciting thing about the market today. We have an opportunity once the debt spreads narrow, and I'll talk a little bit about that, to, and once you can get financing, we'll talk about that, but, uh, but the, the, the fact that you cannot actionably do it today should not deter from the value opportunities because even if the companies do not get taken out through, through a uh, financial transaction merger or an LBO, they will in fact go on to buy back shares, increase dividend, all of which tend to be a fairly uh, strong positive for the equity markets. Unfortunately, simply having the potential is not enough because it's very easy to confuse value opportunity with an extinct company. They look very similar in the early stages. And the difference between the two, to, to make yourself more comfortable, you still may want to make a directional bet on the nature of economic recovery so that the mean reversion on which you're betting does play out. So you can find a lot of values, but many of them will turn out to be false values. They will go extinct. So there are three types of mean reversion, uh, or the nature of the recovery can come from one of three things, as it always does. Consumer spending staying strong and potentially picking up. Two, corporate capital spending improving. Or three, financial deleveraging causing improvement in uh, credit spreads. The second mo most positive thing I could tell you about the market and the economy, which is undiscounted today, is the fact that the, uh, that the free cash flow margins, the company's ability to generate free cash flow, is, the, is one of the highest today in, in the history. The cash on, on corporate balance sheets is growing at, at an extremely high rate. And I believe that, that the, the big decision one has to make is whether that cash will go toward uh, financial deleveraging or capital spending. Two industries, telecom utilities and telecom utilities, account for 27% of capital spending in the United States. They will not grow their capital spending. Utilities will reduce it by 10, 15 percent. Therefore, it's very unlikely that with 30 percent declining, you will have a robust capital spending recovery, especially since the other big spenders are not looking to spend either. So the, one of the first potential recovery mechanisms, which is the corporate capital spending, does not seem to be on our side. Second, consumer. Much of the growth has been driven by the subprime consumer. This is the first recession, as far as I could tell, in the history of the United States, where the low-end consumer, the bottom 80% based on income, uh, have accelerated their spending. They were happy. The, ho the home prices are going up, as you all know. And for the low-end consumer, that's a very large percentage of their net worth. They had a 30% return in equity in their home. They took all of that equity out. They spent it. Unfortunately, there is no pent-up demand. 
And much of the growth is coming from the subprime consumer, where the credit risks are very high, and they've been enjoying a tremendous uh, advantage in, in, uh, in low interest rate environment and being able to borrow against their home. So I think betting on the return of the consumer seems highly unlikely unless the high-end consumer, which has, been, has not been spending, starts to do so for therapeutic purposes because they're depressed. <laughs> And many of them, you know, we're, we're waiting for them. And there's a pill for that. <laughs> uh, you know, but pills are pills, but shopping is shopping. So the... Um, I agree. <laughs> so that leaves us with, one, with only one route or one path for recovery, and I believe that's the only recovery path we, we we're likely to see, and that is the financial deleveraging. So if I'm right, and we'll see... Uh, the pay down of debt and the refinancing will in fact start to play out uh, more smoothly going forward. We're starting to see dramatic improvement in cash flows for both utilities and for um, telecom. Some of the areas that are still under stress, like airlines, uh, some of the casinos, etc., will you know, some of them may in fact uh, go bankrupt, etc. But the fact is, in the context of the overall economy, it should not derail the nature of the recovery and the speed of the recovery. So, what are the directional bets I'm making to take advantage of the value opportunities, which are among the highest in the 20 years that we've looked at the market? First is the debtors are likely to benefit first. And we've started to see that. Citicorp went from 25 to $35 in the course of two weeks as the fears, some of the fears regarding the commercial credit risk have subsided. I think that will spread. And to the extent companies, financial companies get beaten down and you can identify those that have the biggest risk exposure in the commercial credit space as opposed to consumer, that's an attractive opportunity. Second, the users of debt, such as utilities and telcos, are going to be the second set of beneficiaries on the, on the recovery. Many of them have started to rise, such as Verizon, uh, Bell South, etc., etc. There's probably a little more room left, but again, if you know the nature of recovery, you could step up when the stocks pull back, utilities and some of the others. Once that happens, it's, it is my bet that the credit spreads will start to narrow, which will eventually then give rise to some capital spending. So. That is kind of the, the logical progression which I see, uh, and that is how I would structure uh, and how I would place bets on some of the value opportunities that are emerging, and that is where the sequencing of mean reversion takes place. Because if you don't want to suffer as a value investor, you're probably going to have to try to figure out where mean reversion is, is likely to show up first. Um, you know, talking about telcos, telcos, I saw a great cartoon the other day uh, vis vis the commercial that's all over the thing. I saw a guy in a jail cell with his cell phone going, Can you hear me now? Um, <laughs> um, um, that's awful. Um, here's a theme I'm getting from both you and Linda. Um, Accounting is a moving target, right? Right. We get pro forma accounting. We get gap accounting. A couple of years ago, the Nasdaq reported pro forma accounting of the Nasdaq 100 of profits of 21 billion, and they reported gap accounting losses of 78 billion. To the SEC, one to the public, one to the SEC. Here's what I got out of the paper today. GM um, shows. Um, uh, Operating earnings, which one accountant called EBBT, which is uh, earnings before bad things, um, of three dollars and twenty-one cents a share, and then S and P comes out with their quarter earnings of negative four dollars and twenty-two cents a share. But um, what you see going on here is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll ask you to answer this because I want to give uh, Larry his his um, you know time on the podium, but. It seems as though as we move from era to era to era, um, accounting isn't this fixed concept of this, you know, we made so much, we, we earned so much, we're paying so much. It's this massively amorphous and complex beast that shifts from here to there to here to there. And um, if you're using the wrong set of standards in the wrong period of time, you can be idled on the sideline just watching the world pass you by. Um, 
Have I got that wrong? Or Look, accounting has always been a language, and, and people can lie in any language. Mm -hmm. So the accounting does not tell me a precise number. It's open to interpretation, and some people put pro forma. So it, it is up to the individual. If they want to look at pro forma number, the, 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 the burden is on the, on the person who's interpreting the language as opposed to necessarily just the company. The company shouldn't lie. But I, I think people are going too far in trying to uh, create a system that is foolproof. That's not going to happen. The, the things that I mentioned about value, dividend discount model, disc discounted cash flow model, LBO models, they're all based on cash. Mm -hmm. The biggest positive I see is cash on balance sheets. Mm -hmm. Now, unless there's two sets of books and they're hiding cash, but that's outright fraud. It's not an accounting issue. So, yes, there's a lot of pressure being put on accounting, and I absolutely agree. Some of the accounting for operating versus non-operating gap, some of the accounting for options, some of the accounting for pension funds is obscure and it's too complex. But I don't think just fixing that is going to make investors all of a sudden, uh, make things transparent to investors. You have to understand why you're looking at P.E. ratios. And I would say 50% of the investors don't. Okay. Um, Larry, you're going to take us down to, um, I guess, what for lack of a a more politically correct term could be called vulture investing. All right. you know, I, I, I am, you know, I, I minimally multi-strategy. I can look at a utility. I'm credit trained, by the way. If you notice uh, from my introduction, I started out life at BT Securities, which is actually Bankers Trust Company, where I was, you know, trained in the typical uh, credit art. Um, but that doesn't even work today. You know, you could look at AEP, which has a beautiful balance sheet, has maintained its dividends since 1980, is yielding 10% maybe. Um, but who wants to endure another six buck down day? I mean, it, it, so unfortunately, there's not much I can suggest to you that you could currently do in the market. Um, I am an absolute bull and an absolute believer on the ultimate. Uh, future of the U.S. economy, you know, is it going to be two years, three years? I tend to be very bearish right now for all the reasons we're discussing, leverage. Um, the things I'm looking at right now are, are, are tending to be probably by normal investment standards pretty exotic. So, for example, there has been a rash of cancellations and bankruptcies in the development of independent power plants in many jurisdictions throughout the United States. Power producers are required to buy the ability to pollute and to emit solids, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, ash, and there has been a whole market grown up around the trading of these rights to pollute, and I'm seeing in situations uh, emissions credits enormous amounts of value stranded for extraordinary discounts. Enron probably has four or five subsidiaries alone where you can buy unsecured trade debt at the level of the plant and get a priority claim on tens of millions of dollars worth of emissions credits. So that's one minute. Uh, as I said, the aircraft business, uh, you know, still a tremendous amount of uncertainty here. And it, 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 it you know, I, I used to say that I would be happy to own any decent 737 because that's the real workhorse aircraft, the uh, the Chevy Caprice of the aircraft industry. But you can go on to various different websites right now and find different Chinese airlines offering out. I saw an offer. I saw six 737-800s with less than six cycles each offered out the other day at probably 20% off what they cost when they were delivered within the last 18 months. So, you know, 707s, you can always scrap the aluminum and take the engines off and make a little independent power plant out of it. <laughs> Don't laugh. There are people who sell kits uh, complete with the bag of concrete so that you could do that yourself. So, you know, uh, the liquidating angle has just begun into a blossoming U.S. economy. All right, Larry. Um, I'll ask you for a quick answer on this, and, and that's that's not really fair, but uh, give me the condensed version. I'm going to pick up a thread of a debate that we've One risk to buying an asset against an asset uh, is a recipe for disaster. The asset's going down in price, but the debt isn't. Um, what's your response to that? 
Well, I, when we had this conversation, I denied that deflation actually exists. Right, so but that's not the answer to my question. <laughs> you can't go to your banker and deny that deflation exists if it does exist. I, 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 as I say, you know, I, I, I think I pretty much X'd out things that are going to deflate. You know, the oil and gas business seems to be a reasonably upward sloping line. The power business seems to be a reasonably upward sloping line. You know, uh, you, you, Vadim is talking about these these basic underlying one or two or three percent numbers that tend to drive everything. The answer is I don't expect it to happen and I rarely ever say I don't expect it to happen but I saw crude oil go down to ten dollars a barrel. Mm -hmm. I saw the government of Venezuela thrown out and replaced by a Maoist lunatic. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that these businesses that I follow have a very strong self-correcting aspect to them. So, uh, and, and, you know, my investment career doesn't encompass the last deep, 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 dire liquidity disruption we had, currency value disruption that we had in the 1970s. So I can't honestly say that I could seize a ship today and go to Christiana Bank or some bank in Oslo and say, give me 50 cents. But... In my investment career, uh, I, I've seen a stable ability to borrow against top quality assets. Okay. This, this yeah. seems strangely apropos, apropos for a, like, <laughs> uh, you know, a panel on valuation. I actually yeah. did, uh, did, did, did notice that. That opens it up, and that's a plug for the Bruce Museum. Does that just seem strangely perfect for a panel on valuation? All right, questions. Anybody? Uh, Talking about disconnects, um, you know, the Dean was sort of sitting there talking about how he's seeing enormous amounts of cash being thrown up on balance sheets in the shelf for the car who was mentioning GE, for example, having an 18 times leverage. How do you reconcile this? Because obviously the you know, big issue sort of that people are facing at the moment is that debt overhang your numbers. I think I was reading in a big credit analyst that it was something like 300% of GDP that is the cost of the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's a pretty much been a straight line up since 1982. So how do you reconcile those two things? You try to separate where the debt is and why it was incurred, and that's very, very important because uh, making sort of broad comments there's a lot of debt is interesting but not terribly useful. Uh, the debt that much of the debt increase, particularly since the 80s, has been household debt and the S corporation debt. Uh, if you actually look at the corporate debt, the increase as percent of assets as uh, percent of capital has has been there, but it's been extremely focused in just actually one industry, or actually two industries, which is telecom debt uh, and to a much lesser extent uh, motor vehicles, industrials, and uh, casinos. And I think I may, may be missing one. But the increase in debt was was about 12 percent per year since '95. It's it's significant, but it's well, not the end of the world. If I may, if, if I understand it, corporate yeah. debt has gone from two trillion to four trillion, doubled since '97. Yeah, again, it's it's it's, it's, it's from from which year? From '97 to 202. That's a five-year span. Yeah, you know, and, and what I would again caution is. A lot. Some people look, will look at the government numbers to come up with that figure, right? right. And the, the tricky I part is from People magazine. So. Okay. Well, that, that's, you know, that's actually, that is actually, that, that is actually a better source than the uh, government, but, but, but still has some flaws. Uh, again, and, and, and I don't need to get into all the detail, but, but it is important to get into those details if, you, if you're going to make conclusions, which is a lot of that debt is actually it turns out to be consumer debt. And it comes in form of, as I said, proprietorships. It's not. <laughs> it's, if, you, if I look at the, 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 the government balance sheets, when they, when they talk, talk about corporate debt, mm -hmm. includes as corporations and proprietorships. Okay, so that's Ford Motor Company and... No, this includes mom and pop's retail store. Oh, okay. And, right. and, and, and a lot of that debt tends to be a, a consumer debt. So my only point is that while I don't disagree that the debt has risen significantly in corporate America, it, it, it is often overstated. Mm -hmm. uh, also, a lot of people, for example, include GM subsidiary mm -hmm. uh, as part of the debt analysis. That's, okay. that's fine. I, I would argue that GM subsidiary is, again, more, more of a consumer debt, even though it gets counted in the corporate debt numbers. Okay. Subsidiaries alone would probably account for about a, a third of that. So if you look at the debt coverage, 
on the tradition, a lot of the traditional metrics among the public companies, large public companies, it is not deteriorated very much. Uh, many of the industries that you would be, for example, people say, oh, technology must be swimming in debt. The technology sector as a whole has net cash of $160 billion. All right? Healthcare industry has a net cash position. So one of the trickiest parts is that the debt historically has been in, in industries that were perceived as quite stable and easy to understand. There were annuity streams, there were utilities, etc. The debt has shifted very much toward industries which we don't fully understand because they haven't been cyclical before, which is telecom. And industries where the variable cost of production is zero, so you could create a fear that is unlike anything you've seen. Well, the variable cost of production is zero, margins go to zero, uh, we get trillion, you know, uh, as in 10 to 12%, uh, but well, let's say half a trillion dollars worth of debt that's going to go bankrupt. Now, yes, you could, you could create all kinds of scenarios such as these, but that's not what's happening. The long distance pricing is actually stabilizing, believe it or not. The ARPUs for the wireless is actually stabilizing. So, my only point is yes, there are going to be more bankruptcies. Yes, we're going to get more uh, pinpricks. But in aggregate, I don't believe that this is a threat to the economy because I think to the extent we get those distressed assets, they have an economic value and they will simply be bought by others who actually have cash on the books and may not need to borrow. They have an economic value and Larry buys them. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You have to wait for the adjustment to take place. You know, the, I mean, I see values collapsing in the industries that I follow. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to even explain why. The oil and gas business properties are falling in value at a time when crude oil is trading at $28 a barrel and gas is trading at $4.30 a unit and the forward curve looks nice. I mean, I actually, the, I do know the answer to why it's happening. It's because if you take Enron and Dynagy out of the equation, they were the, the pillars underneath the forward gas curve and they're gone. So there's tremendous disorganization in forward commodity markets because the people who are willing to pay you cash today for something seven or eight years out don't exist anymore. So the, you know we're seeing such a such a dysfunction in the markets for liquidity. It's difficult to tell. I, I don't frankly I don't see stability anywhere. If somebody says to me that pricing for some sort of utility services has stabilized, you know to me stability is not too flat data points in a row. Stability is like, you know, we can borrow money again and, and get moving on our business model. I, I don't see stability anywhere. Anyone else? Steve? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I want to pick up on uh, Hunt's uh, favorite uh, investment uh, from Warren Buffett. He had a quote. Uh, he said, I'm a daily basis, the market is an opinion poll, and on a longer term basis, a uh, waiting machine. And uh, I'm looking at uh, one of Mr. Zanini's uh, uh, colleagues on the IIS, Lu Jima, a technician from Solomon. She talked specifically about secular bull and secular bear markets. And I was curious if you can take a look at the life cycle if you know, of secular bull or cyclical bull markets within what she perceives in many people to be 18 year secular bear that was probably in And you've seen valuations. Uh, I have not looked at technical analysis on the wave theory or any technical cycle. What I have done, which maybe for whatever it's worth, is looked at, at what would be a fair value of the market on the assumption that history or last 50 so years play, continues to play out in terms of real growth rate, in which case you would conclude at least that the broad market such as S&P 500 would be modestly overvalued at these levels. And so while I, I wouldn't call it a, a horrible overvaluation, which we've had in 99-2000, I would say probably at least 10-15% overvalued, assuming history has some credibility going forward. You were next. Um, the common thing between Vadim and Larry is that if you want to find value, you've got to separate the assets from the management. On yourself, right? And so we've gone from putting a multiple on management's ability to grow to saying, well, there's only value here if I can separate management from the assets. But the thing, you know, you should have laid out you know, what you buy based on a cycle that happens with guys that are all debt. So if the cycle doesn't happen, these guys 
theory of bankruptcy can't be. Is there not something in the middle where there's companies, and, what, and my question is, what are the strengths? Mm -hmm. How would you find companies that are out there where the management is doing with the assets, what do you do with the assets, and they don't need to be separated from the assets? And, you know, are these people being, you know, overlooked because everyone has lost their confidence in traditional accounting measures? How would we find these guys that are running the businesses the way you would run them in such a way that, Larry, you're not going to get your hands on those assets because these guys are running them as well as they're going to be run? Yeah, I mean, how, you know, what screens would you run to find my company? You know, to be honest, it's exactly the same screen I would run as to identify LBO candidates because you don't really, I'm not assuming that you need to take a company away from the management because the company may actually use that care. It's just an identification that shares are undervalued by standards of a private market. Well, they're not giving you the cash, though. I mean, it's theoretical, as you say. I mean, Larry says, stop forecasting, stop thinking what may happen. Mm -hmm. well, what's gonna, happening today? Yeah, and that's what I do. I basically, look at the, uh, the cash flow yield. Actually, their ability to generate cash today, and uh, given appearance of distressed assets, companies with a lot of cash on books would have flexibility. There's one other thing that has very little theoretical underpinning but works. If you actually do screens and you look at price to cash, it's purely just a very simple price to cash on the balance sheet, it tends to be a very effective predictor of performance. Companies with liquidity and flexibility at times such as these uh, tend, to, tend to do well in the market and tend to appreciate it. And that's one of the screens I would look at. Uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of approach my business as, as something of a collector. You know, some, some people collect art and they keep an eye on a painting and hope it's going to come up for sale sometime in their lifetime. And I just keep looking at the same assets over and over again and hoping that someday I may get a swat at them. So I, I build my investment case from the assets up. And if you approach it that way, you start looking for quality assets. I, I, I suppose you have to look at industries that you think have some stability and some ability to generate cash. But the thing that's so much of a concern to me is that, particularly as somebody who came out of a bank and is a credit analyst, is that I don't, I don't see any companies out there that can get through their normal weekly and monthly cash usage cycles without having to draw down on a bank revolver. So I'm not even sure who has cash and what it's all about. I mean, you know, the utility industry is so completely exposed to loss of uh, short-term credit facilities, and I'm wondering when exactly did that happen. I think that seems to conflict with the meaning of the Public Utility Holding Company Act. So, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to, to answer your question by saying there's nothing out there, but I built my cases from the asset up, and... Uh, what's generating cash, what is not leveraged, or what has a, a sustainable, sane amount of leverage. You know, I build things on fixed income cases. You know, what's the spread between what it's costing them to own this asset. Management is not that critical in my view of the world. You, you know, management doesn't make a tremendous difference in operating one power plant to the next. You know, you, want, you don't want to get ripped off. That's obviously an issue, but we're not talking about, like, uh, you know, uh, a crack team of McKinsey-educated, you know, management theorists necessary to make things run. It's really kind of a flip the switch on in the morning kind of skills. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and by the way, I've done extensive uh, business with Enron, and I could I could talk about that for quite some time. But um, it, it's it's all about asset quality, you know, GE turbines versus ABB turbines, Boeing equipment versus this type of equipment, and then you just sort of collect it up together, add it up, and see what works. Uh, I, I wouldn't take a tremendous amount of risk today in an elaborate business model. Okay. Um, I want to throw a question over to Bob Ahrens. Uh, I can't believe the question hasn't come up yet. Uh, before I do, I'd like to um, ask everyone once again, Please, for Steve and Sakai's behalf, uh, make an effort to fill out your comment card. It's really helpful for Steve and Sakai in terms of keeping the quality of the programs up. So we appreciate the effort you've taken, taking a moment to fill those out. I can't believe nobody in this panel evaluation has asked about Beacon Hill and the recent problem with mortgage-backed securities. Um, so I'm going to step into that breach. What about Beacon Hill? And more to the point, um, if you were saddled with the, you know, 
chore of now trying to step in and value that um, inhumanly complex book of uh, insanely obscure derivatives, how would you have done it, and how would you do it now um, post problems? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good starting premise. Um, I actually have no knowledge of you know, anything about the uh, uh, case in question, but you know, all of these things start the same way. Um, I guess my daughter play a game called Six Degrees of Separation, where you can get it from every movie star to every movie if you try it or you can see every person in the world. Typically, that doesn't work to catch it. And what happens, uh, you, you watch portfolios where there's uh, an intent as um, assets rise, liquidity lowers. Um, you, you're looking for a, a hedge that has meaning. And then you look for return. And you start taking the two items that were close, and you start trading down the basis scale. And so they get wider and wider. Um, the only way that you can really see that um, is through transparency. You, you can't see it from outside. You might guess about it. Uh, but some traders can handle it and some can't. Uh, so you have to look at the cycle. Of the How do you value an inverse flow? You know, you just... <laughs> what we do, yeah, we, have to, we have to look at, at lots of instruments from lots of traders. Uh -huh. uh, and we sit down and you have to make sure that they all make sense. You know, transitory pricing... Is that a contradiction of terms? Um, with an inverse flow? No. no. Um, transitory pricing is a difficult process. I mean, if you have if valuation uh, for investment takes one tack, mm -hmm. forensic valuation takes another. Mm -hmm. Transitory pricing, you just have to get back and, and look at, um, first look at what the document says. Right. What's the document expect someone to do? Right. The investor should look at that as well. Right. Uh, then you're going to want to look at what other people are doing, what other people, what other asset classes are doing. Uh, and when you sit down and, and you put that together, if you've got 10 or 15 traders trading the same thing and one guy stands out, okay, then you hammer them down. That's where the issue is. Okay. And, and we'll see that at the time. Um, thank you. Linda, very quickly, and then I'm going to take a couple more, but we'll do it in sort of a lightning round fashion. If you were now called in, based on what you've done on long-term capital, to figure out what was the, where was truth and where was fiction at Beacon Hill, where would you start? And I ask you to do that fairly quickly, please. I, I wouldn't I would. I would do the exact same thing. I would, I, would, I would probably separate the assets from management and look at everything individually on a forensic basis. I think you could find management. <laughs> no, I mean, without any, just trying to be quick about it, I would actually just look at the merits of each individual asset and liability, get back to the documents. I'd have to say that that is a core issue, and, um, you know, and really look for the matrixing of pricing and the best you could do to evaluate what you had at that point in time is matrix, matrix pricing and contemporaneous information. Okay, a couple more quick questions. We'll go back to our day jobs. Mm -hmm. right How do you adjust and just focus on the valuation or risk? You talked about utilities and cell phones and banks all being good value for the moment. But these things that have no That's huge. Quick questions. Uh, how much margin of error do I have in the cash being generated? How have historically, how cyclical has historically the company and the industry been? That would the way, that's the way I would adjust for risk. You can do it mathematically in terms of increasing the discount rates. You can look at it in terms of having sufficient margin for error to undertake the risk. Okay. One last one. Uh, Andy, I'm sorry. It's already first. Just an observation. I noticed that the dean had said that there was an average from the lifespan of three and a half to five years in the technology of software and hardware. Is there any correlation to the fact that that's about the same for one, a hedge fund, and two, an NFL football player? <laughs> I, I think it's incredibly correlated, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, on that note, I would like to thank the panel for uh, an, an excellent and diverse uh, range of views on valuations and throw it back to Steve for some closing comments.